You're watching the best television on television. Boston's PBS station, GBH2. In the long moments of winter, there are the weeks to understand, where we've been, what we've done, and to continue our dreams. For underneath the surface of the colorless cold, undefined, and in disguise lies the mystery of adventure. The true nature of our hidden passions. In the northwest corner of Connecticut, far from the pace of the interstates, lies something secret. A place that is as private and as hidden as its ability to capture the adrenaline in our imagination. It is called Lime Rock Park. Right now, things are quiet. But in a few short months, there will be different sounds here. Sounds that will carry through the warmer seasons. Where men and women will make real their notions of what is beautiful and exciting. A place filled with long-term relationships. And considerable speeds. A place where crowds will gather under shade on hillsides and root for their friends and heroes. For now, nature must take it at its own speed. On this one and one half mile road race course that is a special home to the American road racing community. You know, it's a long time ago, but that is so vivid um, in my memory. I, I drove up here with a race car behind my car. It is so beautiful, the area. That was my first thought, because, of course, I saw that before I saw the racetrack. And I thought, oh, boy, what a shame. You know, I'll never be able to make my living here. Um, and, of course, here I am, a long time later. I think the most significant thing is it doesn't look much like a racetrack. You know, most racetracks are very busy, lots of signs, uh, lots of sporting event things going on. This is grass and trees. Uh, the signs, which of course you need, are all clustered together. This is really a park, and I think that's the big difference.
With the rains of spring comes the desire to get on the track. It's at this time when Lime Rock Park opens its gates. The year's first laps are reserved for those who come to learn. For many, it's their first real contact with racing. first small steps that racing schools must make sure of. Here, everyone starts out equal, and everyone has his own reasons for trying. Now, belting in requires these four belts, or five belts, really. Names like Andretti, Gordon, and Montoya have passed through as well as three-time 24 Hours of Daytona winner, Butch Leitzinger. I think that the driver schools are the best way for someone outside the sport to get a feeling of what it's like to be a race car driver. Uh, if you just see racing as cars going in a circle very fast, it's really not very interesting. But if you see the human element, what it takes to make a car go fast, and all the many corrections we make in a turn, and, and what it takes to excel at racing, it makes it much more involving, I think. And the best way to do that is go to a driver's school where you can just pay so much to, to go for three days. You don't have to invest in a car. You don't have to invest in a helmet even. You know, they have all that. Go ahead. And, uh, and you can see for yourself if it's something that you're interested in. Those who are interested quickly begin to understand that racing is an accessible and colorful sport. But taking it to the next level means traveling on an expensive and unpredictable road. Living for the weekends and a series of regional races. At Lime Rock in the spring, many drivers experience their first competition. These events are open to the public and usually draw smaller groups of people. To many, it's also their first time in a world where lime rock means racing. When I first saw lime rock, I saw it the way I think a lot of people do, which is from the outside of the first turn, not the infield, but from the outside, just off the main road. And it's like coming into a stadium because you come over the brow of this little rise and the track is laid out below you, and it's all green and magic, and the cars are there, and it's really fabulous. But the best part, I think, is that the track itself is like a drive through the countryside of northwestern Connecticut. It's very faithful to the kinds of roads we have around here. Uh, and great road racing tracks anywhere in the world embody that local flavor, and uh, this one does to a remarkable extent. Once you're on the track, 
the final dimension unfolds. And so you have a wonderful sense of hurtling through the landscape, the Connecticut landscape. As the undeniable sound of horsepower heads out into evening, it reminds us that when it comes to Lime Rock, the Berkshires have a special story to tell. This is a guarded and inspiring land, cut open by the speedy Housatonic River. In the spring of 1955, northwestern Connecticut was on the brink of a strange transition For Lime Rock Park, the beginning is a fascinating lesson in fate and the determination of one man. When he wasn't too busy, gravel pit operator Jim Vale would be known to race around the dirt roads of his father's land with his friend Jack Fisher. Well, he happened to have the misfortune of buying an MGTC. And uh, one time he came down, for some reason I was at the infield, and he just drove around the perimeter of the field and it looked pretty good, so I drove around and I said, this is fun. And then he evolved from there, three or four or five of us <laughs> delinquents, adult delinquents would go down with beer and onion sandwiches, as I recall and take turns driving this poor MG into the ground. Roar around, another guy would jump in, roar around, the same thing would go on all afternoon. Playful times aside, Jim Vale was a constructor at heart. But his sports car buddies were planting some serious thoughts about building a racetrack. They had all heard of a place called Watkins Glen, Watkins Glen was a relatively new road racing course in upstate New York, where large crowds gathered to view the spectacle of heroic post-war race drivers. Vail envisioned that the family land could also be a place where people might gather to watch racing. And just perhaps, fortune seemed not far behind. Lime Rock, Connecticut was a world away from things like this. A community of farmers, retirees, and weekend New Yorkers who only wanted the peace and quiet of the Berkshires. But the direction of the small town's environment would soon change when Jim Vale announced his plans for a road race course in the Salmon Kill Valley. And all of a sudden bells rang and dollar signs appeared and I says, why not? So we had a town meeting and all the screaming and yelling went on, you know, pro and con at the town meeting. And uh, I beat the nose two to one. I had a feeling it was going to be built anyway. I don't know why, I'm just stubborn and perverse, I guess. There was, of course, much debate. But perhaps it was fate or a simpler time or maybe the blurred visions of fast and blinding riches. In the end, a community on a long spring night took a chance and cast some lucky dice. A racetrack in the middle of nowhere was approved practically overnight. The only question was how to do it. with an aerial photograph, his father's support, and a small legion of local investors, Jim Vale fired up his bulldozer. He cut an almost predetermined path, inspired by the landscape. But the work wasn't easy. 
The days were beyond long. With me, it was an obsession, really. It ruined one marriage for me. My family was second rate. You know, I just didn't see them hardly at all. I was either going to New York trying to raise money or working 18 hours a day at the racetrack, come home exhausted, fall to bed, get up, and, you know. It was a tough period. My uh, first wife just couldn't take it. She just, it was too much for her. Things got a lot worse. In August 1955, the entire Northeast was hit by one of the greatest floods in recorded history. The devastation was the kind you read about. For Jim Vail, he would lose much of his equipment and have to practically start over. Although building a racetrack amidst a natural disaster was never in the plan, he would recover. He began to realize that once finished, he'd need expert help in the unusual business of auto racing. The name John Fitch came to mind. Fitch was a war hero and a remarkable career racer who'd won the 1953 12 Hours of Endurance at Sebring. He was smooth and aggressive, driving the powerful cars of Briggs Cunningham. He'd been the first American to live and race professionally in post-war Europe as part of the vaunted Mercedes-Benz team. 1955 had also been eventful for John Fitch. In the 24 hours of Le Mans, his Mercedes teammate, Pierre Levesque, would be involved in the greatest disaster in racing history. Levesque crashed into a slowing car in the grandstand straight and flew into the crowd. 82 people, including Levesque, perished. From that dark day, spectator safety would be a personal crusade for John Fitch. Fresh from tragedy, Fitch returned to the U.S. and soon learned of the Berkshire project of Jim Vale. With his keen sense, he signed on, forming an unlikely alliance of small-town gravel pit operator and big-time racer. Well, I could see the potential of it right away, and it was uh, very attractive, uh, sort of nestled in the hills and almost cozy like a well-laid-out farm. Following the path of the bulldozer, Fitch brought a world of commercial and professional understanding to the upstart venture. Lime Rock as a venue could be like the great tracks of Europe. Initial plans called for Le Mans-style pits, enclosed viewing boxes, and an exotic spectator bridge. Money, however, would always be a problem and these plans shelved. But despite budget constraints, Lime Rock Park's one and a half mile course would be a quick and challenging drive and visually stimulating for the public. More importantly, it would be a race course designed with spectator safety in mind. John Fitch didn't want another disaster. My concern was to make an interesting, challenging circuit uh, with the first priority being safety of the spectators, and the second, the drivers and the participants. Fitch enlisted the aid of Cornell Aeronautical Labs to help study race car behavior at high speeds. He saw Lime Rock Park as a living laboratory, as well as an autosport venue. An early cover article in Sports Illustrated spread the news of the idyllic Connecticut race course dedicated to a mission of understanding vehicular safety. In the end, it was Jim Vale who developed the uncommon masterpiece with common sense, construction skills, and a great location. But it was John Fitch who knew everything about racing and who helped Jim Vale hold Lime Rock Park up to the world on April 27th, 1957. It was a culmination of so much work and everything, everything was beautiful that day. 
everybody was happy, the spectator area was crowded, and I just thought it was the best thing in the world at that time. Mine was one of my better days, I guess. From the earliest moment, Lime Rock Park found a faithful legion of fans. It was open and relaxed, a place where people could immerse themselves in the new fun of racing. While drivers such as Walter Cronkite happily burned some rubber, children could roam free and play on the muddy hillsides to the point of exhaustion. The track itself looked like it had just come out of the ground. It was a remarkably innocent era. Race car owners finally had a place to play. They could let it all hang out and race without the fear of the police in the rear view mirror. Lotus 11s and 18s rocketed down the straight like spaceships. High powered listers tore up the back straight and diced with D Jaguars and Ferrari Testarossas. Porsche 550 Spiders added to the mix, along with a host of Formula cars and small bore entries. In 1959, John Fitch brought together a menagerie of cars to compete against one another on Lime Rock's equalizing course. It was called the Formula Libre, an entirely free-spirited event that saw Indianapolis winner Roger Ward slice and fishtail his way to a stunning victory against larger and more powerful sports cars. Ward ripped the goggles off the competition in nothing more than a low-cost midget racer. We had all those cars running against one another, these different classes, and some people say it was the best race they ever saw. The lead changed again and again. And uh, to everyone's surprise, uh, a midget won the race. Lime Rock Park was the scene of an instant classic, its first time charm never to be repeated. With the Formula Libre and creative events such as the Little Le Mans, the young track was on its way. But not everyone was happy. A concentrated group of local citizens, including the nearby church, took issue with the roar and whine of race cars. This led to legal battles and a superior court decision that there was to be no racing at Lime Rock on Sundays ever. But there was more than the issue of noise. There were enormous risks and financial problems. I had to have rain insurance because if we had had rain on an announced scheduled race day and the crowds didn't come and we had no gate, there wouldn't have been any more Lime Rock. We would have been bankrupt. In spite of the hardships, the mystique of Lime Rock Park began to grow into a spectacle filled with the perfect combination of weekend warriors scraping their last dime to race and the truly talented who were knocking on fame's front door. Perhaps there was no one more profoundly influenced than a young man who had grown up just minutes from the track, Sam Posey. I was a fat kid, did terribly at school, and suddenly here was racing, something which seemed ideally suited to me. Uh, I had quick reflexes, very good eyes. Uh, I quickly picked up on the idea that I could afford a car, whereas perhaps some other people couldn't. And racing became, almost overnight, my goal and my dream. To the famed racer and broadcaster, Lime Rock Park brought personal direction, setting him on a fast career path to Le Mans and the Indy 500. Posey was blessed with record-setting energy and driving skill. He was the first man in history to run Lime Rock in under a minute. In the 1960s, Lime Rock Park grew with him 
in the form of exciting races and people. There was Peter Revson, Dan Gurney, Parnelli Jones, and Lime Rock favorite, Mark Donahue. Donahue's battles with opponents during the Trans Am era of the late 60s were among the greatest moments in Lime Rock history. The Trans Am provided the track with self-esteem and fans with a personal connection. The Trans Am put Lime Rock Park on the map. The racing was brutally pure, the cars bold and filled with enormous talent. Mark Donahue and team owner Roger Penske were dominant. The sight of the blue Sunoco Camaro, with so skilled a driver at the helm, seems eternally burned in memory. In the 1968 Trans Am, Mark took the checkered flag. He became quite used to winning. I was Mark's teammate in the Roger Penske Camaro Trans Am team one year in the late 60s. And I think from that vantage point, I had a chance to see how good he really was, how much he wanted it, how desperate he was to win and to succeed in racing. He really worked hard at it. Towards the end of their days with the Trans Am, Donahue and Penske switched to the red, white, and blue Team Javelin. On a damp and rainy day in May 1971, Mark drove a mesmerizing race. It was an abstract presentation of unique skills. Mark Donahue uh, was an outstanding driver. And he was very intelligent, and he was a graduate engineer. He understood the car. He understood aerodynamics. He, he had the intelligence to deal with uh, the tactics of racing and the strategy of racing. But basically, and mainly, he had this, this uh, just great sensitivity to the loss of control that makes a race driver. To this day, Mark Donahue's name is the most respected in Lime Rock history. For all of his wins, Donahue carried with him a racer's sense of reality. I think that a driver who, who gets hurt racing, is, uh, that's a lot less tragic a scene than um, a guy that's driving down the highway and gets hurt because a tractor trailer jumps the center aisle and, and runs into him head on. Uh, a race driver realizes that it is dangerous and conducts himself accordingly. But the fellow that driving down the highway, he doesn't, uh, doesn't know that it's dangerous, doesn't want it to be dangerous, and if it was, he'd probably pull off to the side. And that's a big difference between racing and, and driving down the highway. There's equal accidents uh, in, both, in both circumstances, but uh, with racing, I think everybody's aware of it and accepts it, and nobody's really very upset if something does happen to somebody. In 1975, Mark Donahue tragically passed away after a crash during a Formula One practice session in Europe. His death hit the racing community hard. Just something about the way he was, his sense of humor, that he'd reach out to shake your hand and pull his hand away, a practical joker. But someone who was warm, someone who was unsure of himself, terribly unsure of himself, and yet able to produce terrific results. I admired him so much and had such a strong feeling for his ability that when Mark was killed, uh, I decided on the spot to retire from big time racing. I continued to race, but in lesser formulas, because I was sure that if Mark could be killed at it, I had no business doing it.
In the days since the era of Mark Donahue, Lime Rock Park has seen a million miles of racing. The track has gained an international reputation as a place where winning requires quickness, patience, and speed. But the big story of recent years is that of technology. Race cars such as Grand Touring Prototypes, or GTPs, challenge the design of racetracks, sometimes altering them completely. In the 1980s, a horrifying incident at Lime Rock proved that some cars are just too fast. Driver John Morton survived, but to this day, specific events require a track set up designed to slow faster cars. While the GTP proved to be extremely popular, it was a newcomer who added his own impact to Lime Rock Park. Academy Award-winning actor, Paul Newman. I think passion is something that, that bleeds into other things. And by the late 60s, I was getting kind of bored with films. And this passion that I developed for, for race cars bled back into my other work. Newman started out just like everyone else, missing the first turn, but put in the time and turned his passion into a smooth talent for driving. With Lime Rock in his backyard, Newman teamed up with Connecticut racer Bob Sharp and quickly earned the respect of the racing community. Well, I think Paul has, has several uh, personal abilities. One is to concentrate on what he's doing, and there may be a hundred people uh, poking a, a, a microphone in his, his mouth or a camera, uh, and he can concentrate on, on the race car and not let that perturb him. Uh, he's got a, a, an ability to be very smooth, and, and any winning race driver is a smooth race driver, not yanking and jerking. That may look fast, but to put consistent fast laps together takes smoothness, and Paul's an extremely smooth driver, and I think he takes his craft very seriously, whether it's acting or driving in race cars. Well, I skied, I boxed, I wrestled, asked Joanne, I danced, and played tennis, and I never found any physical grace in any of those sports. Uh, a race car was the first time that I had really been graceful. Despite his fame, Paul Newman is like all people who pass through the gates of Lime Rock and into the green mystique. A classic land that in late May begins to fill with the flow of racers and their teams. It's the beginning of the Memorial Day weekend and there's no holding back the business of racing. Months of planning transforms the valley into a kind of New England village. At Lime Rock, racing is bringing in summer's welcome colors and some of the world's quickest race cars. Their drivers will soon be reminded that Lime Rock Park is a tough place to master. The challenge of Lime Rock begins with a long straight that leads to a bending first turn. The S's snake towards the back straight and a swift uphill turn that levels off. Then west bend and the downhill and a right back to the main straight. challenging and difficult that we face on the whole circuit. It's very high confidence, very high speed, uh, high consequences for things to go wrong. 
but that, at the same time, makes it much more rewarding whenever you do it right. Successful driving at Lime Rock uh, depends on uh, finding one's way around. It's not obvious. Lime Rock is an adversary in the sense of a prize fighter being an adversary. And if you go a little harder into one bend, the next bend comes up at you in a different way. Never forget, this is a rough, tough racetrack. It is enormously difficult. And everybody that comes here for the first time looks at a map. Ah, there's only five or six corners. This has got to be easy. And you've got to really be a Lime Rock master to uh, win here. Entry to the uphill turn is probably the last part of the track that anyone takes perfectly. At the bottom of the uphill, the car goes through a split second of compression. It settles hard into the road, and you get a lot of steering. The uphill, west bend, the downhill, and they come, you know, bing, 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 right after each other. Uh, the road looks awfully narrow. Uh, in, in those corners in a fast car. The part of Lime Rock I find the most troublesome and also the most fun and the most rewarding when you get it right is the downhill. And it's something where it always feels like you probably go through it flat out if you have everything right. Go under the bridge and you see the downhill unfolding in front of you. You get a feeling in the pit of your stomach. It's a scary place and you know that getting through it is going to require an act of bravery. If it isn't scary, you're not trying. It's got to be scary. mistake coming down the hill at Lime Rock on that very fast corner. You're usually uh, just a passenger once you get out there, even though you, you try to fight it for a long time. It's one of the cool things is that you actually have quite a bit of space, but you can't do much about it. So you actually just see the wall coming for a very long time, and there's nothing you can do about it, but, uh, even though you, you keep trying. No place could ever be rich with energy without the people who are witness. On Memorial Day, Lime Rock is like a carnival, ushering in what will soon be the first days of summer. People need to be in places that are warm, that in time feel like home. It's the way we want to remember ourselves. The fun of motion and without limit. The Memorial Day weekend combines the new era of road racing with that of an old fashioned get together Most people come to watch racing and to be part of the nationally televised consciousness. For race fans, Lime Rock's entire paddock is open. You'll find famous drivers, well-sponsored race teams, and the story of emerging talent at a young age are resourceful enough to be living out their passions. 
I really like the speed and the, the competition. It's a real challenge physically and mentally. You got to be able to concentrate and be on it every second you're out there. It's really fun uh, to, to win races, to be on the top of your game, and, uh, to, and, and just even finishing a race gives you a sense of accomplishment that's uh, really awesome to experience. A driver usually goes fastest when they're scaring themselves, so you always got to have a moment out there. But uh, for the most part, if you're on top of your game, if you're going fast, then and you're you're prepared for it, then it's not as scary as it could be to somebody who's not ready for that type of experience. Sarah Sensky and her opponents, Memorial Day is proof of the inherent qualities of racing, a war requiring great reflexes. And with the future dependent on how far you can feel down the track, driving with a silence that is reaching while the public stands witness, the real stewards of tradition in a forest of speed. It is said that the urge to race began to spark within us the moment that the second automobile was created. Perhaps there is something innate in all of us to want to go faster, to break the rules. At racetracks, a thin veil exists between things we can and cannot normally do. It's enjoyable and stimulating. John Fitch calls it the virus. The virus is the 
intoxicating and addicting compulsion to race. Once you get this bug to go uh, racing, it's, it's uh, almost irresistible. Broken up many marriages, for instance. <laughs> I think racing drivers, I, I agree with John Fitch. I think there's a virus, he used to call it a monkey on the back. There's something that we can't seem to exorcise uh, from ourselves uh, without uh, doing something as violent as racing. Yeah, it's like the West Nile virus. It really kills you if you're weak and senile. Obviously, what you want to do is win a race. My father raced, and uh, I grew up going to the racetrack. And uh, from the beginning, I knew that's what I wanted to be. I think for a lot of us, part of the reason we race is because it's what we do well. The feeling of accomplishment whenever you can come across the line first, it's, uh, it's, it's something that's very hard to give up once you've uh, become addicted to it. Racing is the one thing that I've always wanted to do. It's the one thing I've always wanted to excel at. It's the one thing I've always wanted to pursue. It's the constant in my life. I definitely have days that are more important. I have relationships that are more important. And I have family that are more important. But this is the one thing that I can pour myself into wholly and have some control and work for the outcome that I desire. I think if you want to race as much as I wanted to race, you've got to do it. I couldn't have moved on to the next thing in my life, whatever that might have been. It, Racing was like a door, and as long as that door was shut, I was looking at that door, trying to figure out a way to open it. I think you have to take it on in view of all the risks physically, in view of all the expenses. You have to do it. You just can't get on with the rest of your life. But if you don't have that motivation, it's not a sport for you. why people race. They come in many forms. In early September, Lime Rock takes on the tone of a pilgrimage, celebrating the heritage of racing and offering up living history. For four days, the Fall Vintage Festival is an immersion into the romance of design. People will tell you that race cars are beautiful because of the form follows function theme. Or that perhaps they're beautiful because they're a kind of irreducible minimum. A race car isn't anything more than what it has to be and nothing else. I find the lines to a good car to be hypnotic almost sometimes, and very seductive, certainly. Uh, I think the, an ugly race car has almost no interest to me. I've driven in my career several times making perhaps bad career decisions in order to get myself into a beautiful car. One such race car worth arguing about is the Ferrari 512. There's just something that is utterly resolved and unresolved about the styling. It was before the ground effect era, and it had perfect balance. And it was such a pleasure to slide that car through the turns and shift it. And I loved the way it looked, and the way it sounded, and the way it went 225 down the straight. This is the kind of racing that takes you to a different place with works of art that are well cared for and alive. And yet there is a stillness. For one day, Lime Rock's entire straight stops and opens up, giving a chance for newcomers to get up close and inside. 
Who can say who it might inspire? Like the moments of a final lap, the vintage festival winds down. There'll be more racing, but gone are the long, anvil-hot days. It's time to pack it up and head back to responsibilities. As another New England summer slips away into the cool air of history. Racing in America has reached impressive heights of popularity. In mid-October, Lime Rock welcomes NASCAR's Bush North series, drawing the most enthusiastic fans of the season. For the drivers, it's the last event of the year and the final test of desire. While the race is going on, you're probably enjoying it at the deepest level you can enjoy anything. It's the result of all those desires and all that effort and all the struggle that you've been through and those are the moments that you wait for that there's no other way to be than to be content and to be happy and to go out and try harder at what you're doing. Winning in any sport is usually the pinnacle. But there might be more. I don't know if mystique's the right word for Lime Rock, but there are an awful lot of people that love this place. Lime Rock means an awful lot to a lot of people from many different walks of life who have found themselves attracted to it and I think hold an image of the track in their mind a lot of the time that they're away from it. I think if you ever tried to close Lime Rock, you'd hear from an awful lot of people in a hurry and you'd hear from them very loudly. For nearly 50 years, people have trekked to the secret valley in the Berkshires. A valley layered rich in the dreams of being a racer. As the season evaporates from memory, there's but a moment to be reminded that in the end, Lime Rock is not just about racing, but about the freedom that comes with it. John Fitch wrote, Racing is for those who see in a turning wheel both the principle of motion 
and the promise of other horizons. It is for those who see in a fine automobile an expression of man's will, one form, his art, and the evidence of his longing to move with precision and grace. As the chilly air meets the shorter days, the secret valley of racing is trapped in a fiery setting. At Lime Rock, the tone of racing school engines slowly fades up the hillsides and into the final light. Taking desire as far as a year will go and echoing in the dreams of the adventurous and the young. That sound comes with a guarantee to return again in the hopeful light of spring. <laughs>